right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 10 o'clock briefing. We have four excellent speakers on this briefing and one uh, speaker who is in the audience joining us today as well. So this briefing is called New Views on Universal Flu Vaccine Development. And our speakers are Dr. Nancy Messonnier, Director, the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Gary Nabel, the Chief Scientific Officer at Sanofi, David Baltimore, a professor at the California Institute of Technology, and in the audience with us in the front row, John Shriver, Senior Vice President at Sanofi Pasteur, Head of Vaccine R&D. We'll get started. Good morning. Every flu season, I get to admire the efforts of a team of dedicated scientific professionals at CDC who monitor the impact of influenza on the American public. They do yeoman's work studying the virus, observing vaccine effectiveness, and determining the burden of flu each year. They work tirelessly to keep Americans aware of the dangers of influenza to inform the public about what can be done to protect themselves and their families from flu. We all look forward to the day when there is a universal flu vaccine to combat the recurring scourge of influenza. This year is being advertised as a mild season, but we must remember that in a mild season, even then, so far we've reported 19,000 deaths due to influenza, and most of us wouldn't really consider that to be mild. This year, the flu vaccine is doing its job by reducing the risk of ending up at a doctor's office from flu by about half, but only, of course, among people who get vaccinated. Until there is a universal flu vaccine, there are things that we can do to improve the effectiveness of what we have now. We must improve the flu vaccine effectiveness incrementally of the current vaccine and also improve vaccine coverage, which can, which can result in less illnesses, fewer hospitalizations, and of course, fewer deaths. When we make improvements in vaccine effectiveness, even increasing vaccine effectiveness by 5% across the whole US population, we could prevent hundreds of thousands of illnesses and tens of thousands of hospitalizations. The current flu vaccines do save lives. Last season, the vaccine prevented 7 million illnesses, 4 million medical visits, 100,000 hospitalizations, and 8,000 deaths in the United States. We can only imagine how many more illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths could be avoided by improving on what we know works now. I hope the future involves a universal flu vaccine. In the meantime, CDC is committed to continuing its work to improve what we have now to protect the health of Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. So just to extend upon what uh, Dr. Massonnier said, um, if you look at vaccines for flu, there really is a spectrum between a seasonal vaccine that's of a high degree of efficacy and coverage and what we're referring to as a universal influenza vaccine. Now, the issue with the universal flu vaccine uh, is important in that it depends on what you mean by universal. Because if you look at the spectrum of influenzas in both group one and group two, there are multiple of those. So you could have a relatively universal vaccine that covers, for example, all H1 versions that we might see from season to season, or even a brand new H1. Or you might have a universality within the H3, and then you have the H3N2 that you cover. Or the aspirational goal, which I'm, I really am concerned is even attainable, is to have a universal flu vaccine to cover everything in group one and group two. What I certainly would take as a real accomplishment for the field is if we had universality that covered at least the drifts from season to season and perhaps the change that would give you a shift. So the reason I believe strongly that although, as Nancy said, we need to concentrate on making sure we make the seasonal flu better and better, a greater degree of efficacy, greater degree of coverage, the reason we feel that we need some version of a universal influenza vaccine is that if you look at three failings, and now when I say this, I always have to take a deep breath and make sure the audience realizes that it absolutely is important to get vaccinated. Even if the stated efficacy of the vaccine is 30%, 40%, it is always better to get vaccinated than not get vaccinated. So put that on the table. <laughs> Having said that, we have problems with the efficacy of the seasonal flu vaccine. If you look at the chart from the CDC, at best you do about 60%, at worst you do about 10%. So we need to get a better vaccine. Secondly, 
pandemics occur. Uh, we know that historically, and we're almost always behind the eight ball when they occur. And thirdly, we always have to prepare for a potential pre-pandemic, like we did with H5N1, H7N9, and we spent a lot of money developing vaccines that we stockpile for those. So for those three reasons, it's really important to get a, a, a universal flu vaccine. The scientific capabilities of doing that are there. Uh, we're going to be talking about that at our talk this afternoon, but just for very, very briefly and in, 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 in specifically is that the reason we don't have universality is that the body makes a good response against the right epitope at the right time. But that epitope is the one that keeps changing from season to season and when you go from a seasonal to a pandemic. So the trick is to how to coax the body to make a response against a part of the virus that it doesn't generally make very well. There are certain parts of the virus that don't change from season to season. And there's a lot of good work, a lot of good science going on right now over the last few years that are getting us closer and closer to that. And hopefully we'll have the opportunity to discuss that in the questions or this afternoon during the talk. Eric. Uh, thanks, Tony, and thanks, Nancy. Um, you know, when I take a step back and look at uh, where we are with flu, I think that uh, Nancy and Tony said it well. We, we've come a long way. Uh, you know, the, the devastation of the 1918 flu a little over 100 years ago, uh, we didn't live through, but the history books tell us how devastating it was. Over 100 million people died in a matter of months. And the new vaccines really give us a lot of protection against that kind of uh, global health, what I would call disaster. But still, if you take a step back and look at the impact of influenza infections uh, in the U.S., you know, in 2017 alone, there were close to 80,000 deaths. Uh, that's more deaths from influenza than there was from the entire Vietnam War. Uh, more deaths than we have from traffic accidents every year. So it's a real major public health concern. And as Tony said, we have some tools in, the, uh, in our medicine chest to help prevent the outbreaks, but we could do a lot better. Uh, the reason I think all of us are here and excited about where we are in the field is that there have been real scientific advances that I think chart the way towards a universal flu vaccine. Uh, as Tony mentioned, there are, uh, we have a wonderful uh, improved understanding of the structure of the virus, uh, particularly the viral hemagglutinin, which will be the t uh, topic of one of our discussions today. You know, one of the reasons why flu is so challenging is that when you look at the different subtypes of flu, uh, there are uh, a total of about 20 different uh, influenza classes that circulate uh, on the planet. Uh, of those, uh, three, uh, three major ones, actually four major ones, cause disease in humans. And those are constantly shifting. They're constantly mutating. And so we have a moving target. And the challenge is, with all of that uh, genetic diversity and also um, structural diversity, uh, how do we train our sites on the critical targets where the virus can't escape the immune protections that we try to uh, uh, endow to our vaccines? So that's the challenge, but the opportunity is that we've learned so much, I'd say particularly in the last nine to 10 years, about virus structure, about antibodies that are directed to these targets, and also improvements uh, in vaccine delivery. And the final thing I want to say is that uh, this is a, you see on the stage here, representatives from the government, from industry, from academia. This is a problem that we can't, and I should also add from uh, industry, uh, John Shiver, who is our head of vaccine research and development at Sanofi Pasteur. Uh, we'll not be able to solve this problem unless we all come together with a public-private partnership. Uh, the, there's complexity at the level of the virus, there's complexity at the level of transmission, but there's also uh, complexity at the level of translating the scientific knowledge that we get uh, from scientific research uh, into uh, a form where we can make vaccines, manufacture them, distribute them worldwide. And so we all have an important part to play. And I hope in the session this afternoon,
with David's uh, moderation that we'll be able to uh, explore some of these questions as well. Thanks. I'm not a flu virologist, uh, but uh, I've been working on viruses ever since I started as a graduate student in 1960. Uh, and so I've seen uh, some viruses be conquered relatively easily. Uh, it didn't seem like it at the time, but in retrospect, the polio vaccine was relatively easy to make. And polio is always the same virus. The measles vaccine, which everybody should have, um, is always the same virus that's being attacked. Flu somehow is never the same virus from year to year. It's a new challenge. Uh, and the reason is that it's not intrinsically a human virus. It's intrinsically a bird virus. And it's varying out there in the wild, particularly among migrating birds. You can follow the pathway of infection by looking at the migration patterns of birds in Europe and Asia. Um, and that's a, just a wholly different perspective than the polio vaccine or the measles vaccine. And so the, the failure to make a universal vaccine uh, is not thus far. Um, is not because people haven't tried very hard, not because we don't know an awful lot about flu, but because it's a hard problem. And hard problems uh, take a long time. Uh, I've been interested in working on an HIV vaccine for decades now, and the field has been working ever since the discovery of the virus. And we don't have an HIV vaccine. And again, it's not because we haven't put some of the best brains at work in virology behind that problem, but because it's hard. So we have to distinguish between problems that are hard and take a long time and problems that can be solved by relatively simple means. And flu is at one end of that spectrum. Questions, please raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you and kindly state your name and affiliation before your question. First question over here. Hi, Marin McKenna from Wired. Um, thank you all for those introductory remarks. I, I would like to hear from anyone on the panel among all the various strategies for achieving uh, a universal flu vaccine. Do you feel at this point whether one strategy, one virologic strategy, is emerging ahead of the others as being the best pathway to a vaccine? Let, let me take a shot at that. I, I really think it's too early. We have a number of candidates that are in various stages going from preclinical already to one candidate, the MOO1 from BioNVAX, which is in a phase three trial. So I, I think it's always too premature, particularly when you're dealing with influenza, and particularly when you're dealing with the results of a clinical trial. Because if you look at the fundamental principles, there are a couple of candidates that are going down the right path that we think scientifically are an appropriate way to go. I mean, there's ways of trying to get responses against the stem, and you could do that by a number of ways. You can get a headless stem and put it on a nanoparticle, or you could get a chimeric hemagglutinin with one head from one strain versus the stem from another, or you can just do a mixture of overlapping peptides of the invariant regions of the influenza, which is what the BioNVAX approach is. So I think all of those are at least intellectually promising whether or not they're going to turn out into being a home run or even a base hit. We don't know yet. Yeah, if I could just add, I, I think one perspective might be that um, it's going to take time to sort this out. And what it's really going to do, it, you, you're going to need to do clinical trials. And there's no way ahead of time to predict what 
uh, what the outcome of those trials will be. I'd be extremely surprised if we had any answers in less than five years in terms of a major increment. I think we'll actually have uh, smaller increments in sooner than five years. Uh, but one of the other tools that we have, and I think it's uh, also in part to NIH that can be helpful in making those decisions, is that we actually now have the ability to do, to do clinical trials in a slightly different way. We, we have the normal phase one, two, and three, but now through the NIH we have the ability to do challenge studies where we can actually take uh, safe viruses uh, and take human volunteers and actually test the prototypes. Uh, in a challenge model in humans. And that gives us uh, much more confidence going forward uh, to get behind some of the new candidates and make the investments and reduce the time to, that it will take to actually identify promising candidates. Maybe I'll also just add that um, you know, flu continues to surprise us. And so clinical trials are great, challenge studies are great, but in actuality it's not going to be before we deploy the vaccine in the population and see how well it works, that we're really going to have right. real-world data. And so it, 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 it's an incremental Im improvement. And I think Dr. Fauci always tries to say that it's actually not one magic bullet. There may be a series of vaccines and a series of improvements before we see something that's sort of the universal flu vaccine. But even a small increase in effectiveness of the vaccine would save countless lives. And so we shouldn't scoff at those small improvements. Right. Maybe while we wait for the next question, you mentioned, Gary, the complexity of the, well, you all did, but the complexity of the transmission, the virus, the problem. What kinds of fields would you encourage young scientists, so young people who want to get into science to go in to help support this problem in the investigation and lend the most power going forward? Well, you know, uh, from my perspective, the science has never been more exciting. I actually came here. Uh, from a scientific meeting from the Keystone Symposia on uh, uh, vaccine advances and on immunology as well. And I think that, you know, one of the areas that's just blossoming scientifically has been uh, this, the area of structural biology as applied to uh, vaccines and uh, applied to viruses, as David was pointing out. And so now, you know, if you look back 10 years ago when we were talking about the targets on the viral structure, we, we had a vague idea of what was being recognized by which antibodies. Now we have, re, you know, remarkable precision down to the atomic level. And so if I were advising young scientists about what to study right now, I would certainly uh, encourage them uh, to pursue structural biology. The advances in cryo-electron microscopy are, are nothing short of stunning right now. Virology, uh, even though David was studying it since 1960, <laughs> is just as exciting as when you started. Uh, and immunology, and Tony, of course, is a, a preeminent immunologist as well. So it, it's really a very exciting time uh, scientifically. Question here, and then we'll go to one in the back. Oh, good. Right there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Judy Randall, freelance. Uh, we know that the um, immune function declines with age, so I'm wondering, it's sort of a two-part question. Uh, first of all, in this clinical trial that Dr. Fauci talked about this in stage three, are uh, older age groups being included in the trial? And second, uh, I wonder uh, what impact the higher dose uh, currently recommended mm -hmm. for the elderly mm -hmm. is having on, uh, on outcome. Yeah. Well, the clinical trials have varying inclusion and age inclusion and exclusion criteria. The ones that we generally start off with usually are from age 18 to 65. I hesitate to say what 65 is that's old or not. To me, 65 is really young. So, <laughs> but the the answer is we we do have up up to 65, and the 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 higher dose. Um, that has been given to people who are above a certain age actually is a better vaccine in that the higher dose, you get a better immune response. I wonder if you uh, might ask John to comment because John, uh, John's team, the Santa Fe Pasture right. team, developed the high dose right. flu zone. So John, perhaps you can. No, it's a good point. Um, there, you know, there certainly is room to improve flu vaccines, even the seasonal vaccines. And I think that's one of the areas where I draw some optimism that besides there are worthy goals short uh, that fall short of a universal vaccine. 
So, you know, uh, one thing that has been shown, the high-dose flu vaccine is a standard vaccine, but it's just literally a higher dose, gives about 24% higher efficacy in subjects who are over 65. And that's, that's actually uh, probably was the first time that someone's approved a seasonal vaccine in such a way that shows up in efficacy. And it's really important because that population, that older population, is one of those most at risk for serious disease, hospitalization, and death. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's, it shows that you, we can do better, and uh, even with the current vaccines. Right. And, uh, and I think the new learnings, you know, for the, uh, the you know, point towards broadly protective or universal vaccines can add to that further. So speaking of age, just a, a, a quick, quick comment about that is that when we do get, which I hope we do, some version of a universal flu vaccine, it would be absolutely critical to vaccinate the children with that. And the, the reason, the, no, for several reasons. One, you want to protect children. But the other is, is that, as alluded to by, by David, influenza is really interesting because it changes so much. You know, the immune system, evolutionarily, is such that when you get infected or exposed to something, and then later on you get exposed to the same thing, you get a boost. So the ability to remember what you saw before and boost under most circumstances works really well for you. The way you get into trouble with that is if you get imprinted with an original virus that you were exposed to early on, and you get exposed to either slightly different viruses, influenza viruses, that is, or even vaccines later on in life, your immune system tends to want to go back and make a response to the original first one that you were exposed to. It's called imprinting or this colloquial original antigenic sin, which from an evolutionary standpoint actually should work really, really well if you have a virus like polio or smallpox or, or measles that doesn't change. But when you get a virus that keeps changing, this imprinting doesn't work very well for you. So the best thing to do in the perfect world is to imprint the children with something that has more universal coverage. Then you'd have the best of both worlds. And, and maybe just to take that the next step, I mean, the practical implications of that are on the pathway towards a universal vaccine, there may be a point where we'd vaccinate different age groups with different, different. vaccines right. to take advantage of their um, prior, pri exposures. prior right. exposures. The thing I want to say about the um, vaccines for the older adults no elderly here, um, is that there are actually a couple of vaccines that are licensed and approved for those over 65 that either are high dose or have adjuvants in them and are immunologically different than the other vaccines. CDC looks to its Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, to make vaccine recommendations. And at this point, ACIP doesn't have a preferential recommendation for one vaccine over another in those age groups because we're continuing to accrue data to look at those differences, but it's something that ACIP is actively considering. Yeah, Question? but the good, the good news is that, as you were saying before, we actually ha now have vaccines that are giving you those increments that you were asking for. And so I think it is important for the, um, the over 65, and now I guess there's an over 50 vaccine as well, for those people to be aware of those vaccines and to make the appropriate choices. Lauren Niergaard with AP. I wanted to continue on that theme and ask why we wouldn't just give everybody the higher dose vaccine. And also if there are some other things that are, that are out there already, like the new ways of manufacturing the flu vaccines that suggest that they might be actually better than our egg-based. I mean, I get to start with this. I think that um, you know, CDC is a data-based agency and we really have to wait for the science, and I think as those of you who have been covering flu for a while know, um, sometimes we get ahead of the science and are surprised in ways that are not helpful. So there is some data that suggests adjuvanted vaccines and higher dose vaccines are better than their counterparts, but there are a whole class of vaccines that are in that, um, in that category, and we really need to wait to accrue sufficient data across multiple seasons, because with flu, every season is so different. Um, and the same question with the egg and cell-based vaccine. I think um, there are reasons why egg-based vaccines seem old-fashioned in terms of the preparation of them. There are also complexities of having the flu strain grow in eggs, which is actually much more complicated than growing in cells. But we look to the practical data after every season and compare the efficacy. It's one of the 
um, major roles that CDC has. So how does it actually perform in the population? And as yet, there's really not sufficient data that says um, um, confidently that in Americans, uh, cell-based vaccine performs better every year than in egg-based vaccines. So while there may be other really good reasons to make the transition, we can't tell people getting vaccinated or clinicians yet that one vaccine is better than another until there's really clear data. But, uh, and in direct answer to, to uh, Lauren's question, that we don't, and in an agreement exactly with what you're saying, we don't have data to say that if you have a really robust, healthy immune system as a 25-year-old person, that giving you a higher dose is actually going to make it get better. Where we do have data that if you're an, a, a person who's older and has an immune system that isn't as robust, that an, an increased dose actually does make it better. Logically, you would think it would, right? But the data aren't there. Yeah, and the other thing to remember is, um, I think Nancy's talking about you know evaluation of vaccines that are out there now. There's also the future, and uh, I do think to your point that we, it is going to be very important to develop new platforms. Uh, we, I'll talk a little bit about some newer ones that are on the horizon, but there are protein-based vaccines. Uh, and uh, there's at least one uh, that's been shown in uh, adults over the age of 50 to give better coverage for the protein-based uh, delivery. It's a uh, flu block. Uh, and, um, and, but we need more than that. We need more than that. And I think ultimately <coughs> there are biologic reasons why we need to do it. Um, we know, for example, that in the process of adapting flu to grow in eggs that there are changes that occur that then create uh, holes in our immune repertoire that, that can allow the virus to flourish. So it, it, from a research point of view, uh, absolutely we've got to keep exploring uh, these new, uh, new modalities uh, with Nancy's caveat that ultimately they have to be tested in people and we have to see the evidence in, in populations. Two questions in the back quarter, three here. Andrea, thanks for your help. Uh, hi, Kevin Finneran with Issues in Science and Technology. Um, as David pointed out, this flu vaccine is very different from most vaccines that are one and done. So the fact that, that we have recurring need for them changes the economics, the incentive for private sector to invest versus government to, exist, to invest. When we look at the, the goal of having a one and done flu vaccine, how does this change our notion about who should be funding this investment, what is the incentive for industry to do it versus the need for government to do it? Are you, su are you suggesting that industry would not be so excited about a one and done from an economic standpoint? Because I get asked that question all the time. And I think that's an understandable but incorrect assumption. And the reason I say that is if you have a good one and done vaccine that if you look at the number of people who get vaccinated, relatively speaking, throughout the world, it is a small fraction of those who should get vaccinated with influenza. So if we had a measles-like vaccine for influenza, I think the industry would do really, really well. And I turn to my industry partners to back me up on that. Go ahead, <laughs> Well, I can say, speaking for Sanofi, we would absolutely like to have a one-and-done vaccine. That would be a remarkable accomplishment, great public health impact. It'd be great to be able to treat flu like the other viruses that were talked about here. And we certainly take that very seriously. And flu, you know, research on a better vaccine is, in fact, one of our highest priority programs, to the point that we actually created a biotech within our R&D to focus only on flu. That covers all aspects of flu research. We call it Flu Next. And it's just an, an illustration of the priority we do give it, speaking to Tony's point. Question in the back order, first row, and then the second row. Yeah. Hi, uh, Alok Jha from The Economist. Uh, can I ask you, Anthony, for uh, some more specifics on uh, particular strategies that you think are promising? You, you talked about them very quickly uh, at the beginning of the q and I was wondering if you can just describe a few that you think are really promising. Um, and I wonder if you could also comment on um, some techniques being used out of, of University of Oxford where they're trying to recruit T cells to look at the proteins inside the actual flu virus right. rather than the surface proteins. I yeah. wonder if you could talk about some of those in a bit more detail. 
Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do some of that this afternoon, but very, very briefly, because I don't want to take too much time on it. But, but you make a good point. If you look at the molecule of, uh, if you look at the entire virus, there are components of it that are more prone to inducing an antibody response and others more a T cell response, like the internal proteins, like the M2 protein. There's a lot of work now revisiting that. Uh, a long neglected component of vaccinology is the uh, is the uh, neuraminidase, which was something that we have not really spent a lot of time on. It's mostly been the hemagglutinin. But within the hemagglutinin framework, as I alluded to before, the issue, since if you look at the mutational capability and the mutational history of the hemagglutinin molecule, clearly the head is full of a lot of mutations, points that are almost invariably mutate from strain to strain. The stem, not so much. So if you want to focus on the stem, so how do you get a predominant stem response. There are several strategies because the head is what you call immunodominant. So if you present the body with a hemagglutinin molecule, it will preferentially make a response against the head than the stem. That's just the way the immune system perceives it. So if you're going to focus on the stem, you could do it in a number of ways. One, I think, particularly promising approach is to take the stem, get the clone of the stem to express and put it on a nanoparticle where you have essentially dozens of molecules of stem sticking out in a nanoparticle. Those are some of the things that are going on right now. And the other one is that I think has not had as much uh, attention, but there's indications that it does work, is to get essentially a cocktail of different components, of different strains. The BioNVax is doing that by essentially getting multiple nine overlapping peptides that you present to the system which really make an immune response which covers a lot of them. So multiple peptides, internal antigens, as well as the stem for the hemagglutinin are three approaches. Can you also break down? Excuse me? Just, I want to get your comment on the, um, the uh, specific vaccines coming out of University of Oxford, the, the, the Jenner Institute, where they're looking at the inside of, of yeah. the Yeah, th 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 that's a promising. That's in trying to induce a T cell response against an internal protein like M2. We had a question right here. Yeah. Uh, hi, Carl Zimmer in the New York Times. Um, it's my understanding that uh, something on the order of $100 million was spent uh, last year on this sort of research. I might be wrong with that figure, but I'm wondering, given the, the huge burden of seasonal flu and the potentially catastrophic impact of new flu, um, is that commensurate with uh, the threat of the flu, and is there any um, prospect of there being more uh, funds being directed to this research? Uh, your number is correct. It's between, at least at the NIH level. Remember, you've got to talk about uh, the pharmaceutical company investment, which is significant. So at the NIH level, we spend between one and 200 million on universal flu vaccine specifically. The entire portfolio of influenza is between 250 or so. The chances of getting additional funding for that, I think, are considerable. Considerable in that there is a movement now and a realization not only of the importance, as Nancy mentioned, about the burden of disease, which we've always known, but people are paying a lot more attention to that, that there is movement in the Congress. You know, Ed Markey has put together an authorization bill for a billion dollars over five years. Um, so that's good. I mean, that's an additional 200 million per year. Uh, and there's a lot of movement and discussion about the fact that we need to take a much more serious approach. One of the things that was a real wake-up call was last year's flu season, where you had 80,000 deaths and almost a million hospitalizations, which went off the curve of what we had been seeing in the previous years. So I think there is pretty good promise that we'll be seeing more resources. Were there any interesting uh, geographic contributors to, to what you saw last year to the flu season, making it the way that it was? Or? Yeah, I think what was unusual about last season was not just the number of cases and deaths, but that the whole country was impacted at the same time. And so um, CDC does a number of things to do situational awareness on influenza. That data is all on CDC's website. It's updated every Friday, 
and what we saw last year was the entire country lit up all at the same time. Um, typically, flu sort of spreads, and you can kind of see it spread across the U.S. The impact of that, of course, was that public health systems and healthcare systems were quickly overloaded with cases, and since it was the whole country all at once, it was really difficult to cope. So I think that was unusual last year and is part of the reason why it got this kind of attention. Question here, and then we'll come over. Hello, um, Kerry Keenan, freelancer. Um, I would like to ask you if, if you could please explain, I know a lot of people over 65, myself included, who have terrible reactions to the flu vaccine and are too scared to take it now. Um, some, you know, basically the same people that I've been talking to, they just get a hacking cough that lasts for about six months. What do you suggest? Yes, because I think there's a lot of people refusing yeah. to vaccinate because of the reactions. Go ahead. Austin. Yes. Uh, um, you know, I think uh, I think people don't realize how complex and complete the systems are that we use to monitor the safety of vaccines. Um, there are um, incredibly high bars that are undertaken by the pharmaceutical companies even before the vaccines are licensed, and those are specified by FDA at the point of licensure. Vaccines are reviewed by a whole set of advisory bodies to look at all that data. And the number of people who get the vaccines in advance of licensure is actually high. But even after a vaccine is licensed, CDC, FDA, and the pharmaceutical companies continue to monitor vaccine safety forever. And that's why we have such great understanding of the safety of vaccines, flu vaccines, as well as other vaccines. Um, it's important for folks to know that vaccines are incredibly safe. And the U.S. has among the most closely monitored vaccines anywhere in the world, and we have the safest vaccines that we've ever had in history. Um, during flu season, there are a number of other viral respiratory diseases that are circulating. In addition, flu vaccine is not perfectly effective, and it is still possible to get sick, although um, hopefully less sick than you would be. So it isn't unusual for someone to have a respiratory illness even though they got vaccinated. I think the misunderstanding is that it's being caused by the vaccine. And the data is really clear. You cannot get influenza from the vaccine. It's biologically impossible. It's, it's not a flu vaccine. It's not a flu effect that's, right. that I'm talking about. I'm talking right. about a hacking cough. Right. Yeah. It's not actually virus. It's just a hacking cough as a reaction yeah. to the flu vaccine. You know, right. it's just like you're trying to get rid of it. Yeah. So <laughs> let me just underscore what Nancy said about co-circulating infections. Um, the monitoring of when we do clinical trials, uh, there are different grades of adverse events, um, and there are more adverse events reported than are not really adverse events. So if I get a flu vaccine, walk out of the clinic and fall and break my leg, breaking my leg is considered an adverse event of the flu. So you always get more than you really do. When you look at the adverse events associated with an injection of a flu vaccine and you compare it to a placebo, there's no increase in coughs. So that's the data. I mean, it, it is the data. Yeah, um, you know, right. yeah, I mean, I, again, as Dr. Fauci said, we monitor these things not just at the point of licensure, but afterwards. And so forever after a vaccine is licensed, we compare people who are vaccinated versus people who aren't. So I can tell you on a global, but mostly on a national level, the phenomenon you're talking about, that's not what the data says. That being said, of course, I don't know your personal situation. What we tell people who are scared about vaccines, any vaccines, is they need to talk to their own doctor. Your doctor is the one best place to make decisions for 
and with you. You know, decision making about vaccines is a shared responsibility of a clinician and a patient. And so you really need to be talking to your own doctor who can make the best advice for you. But I can tell you that the data is really clear on this about the vaccines being safe. We'll move to one last question here. Hi, I'm Ivan Amato, a visiting researcher uh, at AAAS and I work on a communications project funded by the philanthropic organization Schmidt Futures. So I recently was talking to a, a, a Ebola vaccine researcher who was fascinated by a, a, a procedure there of finding uh, a survivor, uh, fishing out effective antibodies there, uh, and then working backwards in a sense in developing genetic constructs, hmm. putting those in and, and using those as the basis to essentially make our own bodies the vaccine generators. Hmm. So I'm wondering if uh, in the flu vaccine research community that you have sought out individuals that year after year have been exposed to all these varying flus and never get sick. And so the question would be, do these people have some kind of magic universal anybody right. that could save us all. So uh, it, it gets, well, first of all, you're referring to monoclonal antibody 114 that was developed <laughs> at the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's really different because it gets back to what David was saying about measles versus polio versus flu. So Ebola that is in DRC and that was in West Africa doesn't change. So the Ebola that that person who got infected in 1995 in Kickwick, and we brought him to the NIH and cloned his B cells and made a monoclonal antibody, the virus that's circulating right now in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is exactly the same as the one that was circulating in Kickwick in 1995. So we're using that antibody as a therapy, not as a prevention. So that would be non-practical when you have a flu that keeps changing. So my antibody against a flu that I got, which was an H1N1 back in you know, 2001, is going to be very different from the H3N2 that I might get exposed to next year. So the concept that you're saying of passive transfer of antibody is a very important concept, usually for treatment, but even sometimes for prophylaxis. We're doing that for prophylaxis with HIV in a big trial in South Africa, but it's not really feasible for influenza. Although what I would say is we've done what you're, what you're asking in a different way, which is that we have looked at many individuals who've been infected, and then because of the, uh, our ability to screen across multiple viruses, we can identify people who do have antibodies that neutralize those diverse viruses. And that's actually the way we came up with the stem as a target, just as an example. So we, we and Tony's exactly right, we can't, uh, it, it's unlikely we would use these antibodies at least now and maybe in the foreseeable five to 10 years as a preventive themselves. But what we can do scientifically is this process that we call reverse vaccinology which is we can use those antibodies to identify the structure. In this case, it's the highly invariant, and then we can turn that into a vaccine. So in fact, we have done uh, the, that approach in a slightly different way. Great, so we've now reached 1045. I imagine there may be additional questions for our speakers, so we can make a follow-up room available, the Buchanan Room, and um, you can continue to, to talk to them there. But thank you so much to our speakers. That was a wonderful panel. Thank you.